my gosh, hello. Okay, I think, think I might be live. Um, this is going to be my animal behavior chats because the wonderful Neil Hutchins Resto, his studio has broken this week, so we can't do YouTube. As geeky as I am, I am not the best with software and technical things. Um, so I'm gonna try going live straight into our wonderful group which hopefully this is working just now. So if anyone is watching, if you can give me like a like or a thumbs up or something, just to let me know that, that you're there and you're listening, because um, it'd be really cool to see if you can hear me. Because today on the live chat, we were gonna talk about biting dogs. And there's a bit, bit of discussion this week in Policy Pet Advice all about biting dogs. Let me just check that you can all hear me okay by checking with the other admins. Love technical issues. Every week on live chats we have technical issues. But you know, I'm British so we just drink tea and don't worry about it. Okay, so biting dogs. A lot of people have dogs that bite, unfortunately. And it's really worrying when your dog does actually start to bite people um, or other animals um, or even themselves in some cases. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a chat about what causes dogs to bite, the reasons why they may bite. Um, and then if anyone's watching, if you've got any questions, if you've got a biting dog, if you want me to go over anything again, we can do. We've got about half an hour on our live chats um, for us to go through things. Um, hoping you can hear me okay. I'll put the microphone a bit here. Usually I've got like my headphones and everything and it's a bit slightly more technical. Um, I will speak up Lisa, I promise, I'm trying. Um, so, biting dogs. What are the reasons that dogs may bite? Well, it depends on the context of the situation and the dog that you own. Um, so bites in general can vary from playful bites. So puppy mouthing is probably the biggest one that a lot of people tend to worry about. If you have a puppy, they will bite you. Um, this is going to happen. It's kind of what puppies do. Um, and you just have to make sure that you don't reward the behavior too much, try and redirect them onto something else, give them another outlet for the biting behavior. Um, you've also got the excitement biting and the mouthing. You see this a lot in kind of gun dog breeds and retriever types. Um, Labradors, golden retrievers are the ones that come to mind. Um, where if they get really excited, they like to just grab hold of you or hold of something. And so they tear it off and will kind of jump up and mouth. And it's not them being nasty or anything else. It's just they like to have things in their mouth. And when they get very excited and over aroused, they like to carry things. In those situations, teach them to go and fetch a toy is usually a really useful thing. So if visitors arrive and you've got a Labrador that jumps up and bites and tries to kind of mouth all over people. And it's not a pressure bite. It's not a serious bite. I'm not talking about dogs that kind of jump up and actually want to injure the people. Um, we're talking about dogs that actually just get excited. Teach them to go and fetch a toy. If they've got something in their mouth, they're less inclined to jump up, they're less inclined to start mouthing and nipping you. Um, you've also got the dogs that may get a little bit frustrated. Um, on the live chats that we did two weeks ago now with the wonderful Jane Arden, we discussed a little bit about the pitfalls of positive training. One of the problems that you can get with a lot of positive training, if it's not done right, is you get frustration bursts. And if an animal is frustrated, they get over aroused, overwhelmed, and then they can lunge and bite you. Um, so keeping them a little bit calmer will help a lot with that. Being aware of the body language of your animal, are they getting frustrated? Um, some dogs that pull a lot on the lead and if they've got dog-dog reactivity issues. Um, sometimes it's a fear-based thing. Sometimes the dogs generally just want to fight. Um, sometimes it's frustration. So knowing which one you're dealing with is going to be really, really handy and helpful to you. So if you're dealing with a frustrated dog, they really want to get there and they want to get there fast. So if you try and take them away, they just pull and they pull and they pull and they want to go back and they, they vocalize excessively. They become like a whirling Tasmanian devil creature on the end of this lead. Um, and they really need to learn some frustration tolerance. Um, and they need to learn how to calm down a little bit. Because by the time they get to whatever it is they want, some of them are really overwhelmed that when they get there, they will bite and it will look aggressive and they will be labeled nasty and vicious and all these other words, which simply isn't the case for a lot of these animals. They're not nasty, they're not vicious. They're just highly aroused and frustrated and don't know what to do. 
similar to people, if you, best way I've got for frustration is if you think of a vending machine. I was described this example by the wonderful Dr. Anne McBride at Southampton University. Um, and she's like, a lot of dogs will see you as a vending machine. So they'll put their money in, they'll get their chocolate out. So they will do something, they will get a response. And this is where biting, particularly the attention seeking types of biting and the frustration bitings will come in. They will do something, they will expect you to respond. So you've got, say, a seven month old dog that is pulling, trying to get towards another dog, or you've got them that are barking and bouncing at you, wanting your attention and not getting it. They'll get frustrated because their chocolate isn't coming out of the machine after they put their money in. As you know, people deal with frustration different ways. So when they put your money in and you don't get your chocolate out, what do you do? Well, some people remain nice and calm and they're like, okay, that didn't work, that's fine, I'll just lose my money and leave. Other people get a little bit annoyed and might start to hit the vending machine. If at either of those two points your chocolate comes out, you're going to learn that the next time your chocolate doesn't come out, you either relax and walk away and hope that good things will happen, or you hit the machine, in which case you bypass putting your money in and you just go straight for the hitting. So these are your dogs that will just start jumping up and mouthing. I saw a case like this a couple of weeks ago of a wonderful German Shepherd puppy, seven months old, adorable. But he'd learned the best way to get his owner's attention was to do this jumping up, mouthing things. And she would, he would bruise her arm. He was biting quite hard, but his bites weren't malicious. He just learned that, that was the best way to get his attention. And if she tried to ignore that behavior, as recommended by a lot of trainers, the frustration got worse. He didn't understand why this wasn't working anymore and would try harder and harder and would bite harder and harder until she had to have basically shin pads on her arms to protect herself. Um, so we did some work. We taught him different behaviors that he could do that would get him the attention that he wanted while reducing the biting behavior and things like that will work really well because you're giving the dogs a predictable environment. You're reducing that frustration by educating them. Don't do this, do this instead. And focus on that. Try not to stop the unwanted behaviour. If you focus on it too much, it can it can break down your barriers a little bit. The dogs don't always understand. Um, whereas if you say, actually, if you want my attention, just do this. And that can be like sitting on your bed, going to a rug. There's actually a lady in our group at the minute that has a dog that keeps barking for attention. These are the kinds of things that you do. Is you teach them the alternative behaviour. So you don't reward the behaviour that they're giving you. So if they start acting at you, either ignore it or walk out the room depending on the dog you're dealing with. Teach them something else. Other reasons dog may bite is through redirection, which again is an element of frustration, where they want to get to something they can't, so they redirect onto the closest object. You will see this on sometimes with dogs that will walk together, sometimes dogs that are barking at the window and a friend comes to join them, or when someone walks into a room and lots of dogs come along and then they have a bit of a squabble over who gets there first. And a lot of that is the redirected aggression that comes through. And it's not, again, it's not malicious. It's these dogs saying, I really want to get to this. I can't get to this. Oh my God. Someone else bangs into them and they just, they bite and latch on. And it's usually very kind of quick, suddenly intense sort of reactions that they do. Um, it's bite and let go, bite and let go. Or depending on the dog, it might get into a little bit of a scrubble. And it's all noise and very frustrated. And it's a difficult thing to deal with, particularly when you've got multiple dogs. So again, it's lowering those expectations, teaching them what to do in these scenarios, building up predictable cues. So you lower that frustration so they don't get frustration. If you lower the expectations, you automatically reduce the expectation. And dogs are really context specific. So we want to make sure that we're, we're bearing this in mind with all of our training. Um, other reasons dogs may decide to be aggressive is the big one that I see a lot is fear. They're scared. And a lot of dogs will then, if they get too scared, they'll do the warning signs. They will kind of, they'll throw all their brows, they'll lick their lips, they'll look away. And they're all signs to let you know that they're, they're not listening. And if you don't listen to those signs, they escalate them. If any of you, well, obviously you're online. So if you Google ladder of aggression um, by Kendall Shepherd, you'll see the stages on the rungs of the ladder that the dogs will go through before they get to the aggression. So in theory, nose licks, looking away, are still signs of aggression. They're just the ones we don't listen to. They're the whispers where the dog's like, I really don't like this. I, I, I don't like, just please back away from me. You're not listening. Then they're forced to speak that bit louder. And that's where the lip wrinkles come in. That's where the growls start to come in. The snaps and the bites. They're the ones that we listen to. They're the ones that we class as aggressive. The dogs are just asking us to back away. They're asking us to move away and we're not listening because we see the growls as conflict. 
don't you growl at me, I'll show you who's boss, and we see it as a threat. Whereas a growl from a dog's point of view, if you think about dogs, they are evolutionally a social animal. Their ethology is social. They have an entire repertoire of behaviours that are designed for conflict resolution. They're not designed to fight, they are to resolve conflict. They are to let other animals know that they're too close, that they're in their space. And that's what these growls mean, that's what the snaps mean. If we can listen to the ones on the lower end of the ladder, so either the freezes, they're looking away, you're not going to get them up to that point where they're going to growl and snap anymore. And if they really understand that these are the ways to get us to move away, they'll do those behaviours more. So really, when you're dealing with dogs that are fearful, listen to the whispers, don't make them shout, don't push them to that limit. And if they are growling and snapping, back away. There is nothing wrong with moving away. You are listening to that dog, you are respecting its space. Move away from it, give it that space. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to get bitten. Um, it just breaks the trust and the bond between you, and that's not something that you that you want to have to deal with. Um, if you are having problems with a biting dog in that case, please, 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 please get in touch with a professional, ideally a registered and qualified clinical animal behaviourist or a veteran behaviourist, depending on what country you're at. Um, here in the UK, we have registered clinical animal behaviourists that are academically knowledgeable, they are experienced, they have been assessed time after time after time after time. Believe me, I've been through it. The, ju the hoops you have to jump through to get registered clinical manual behaviour status are they're, they're pretty high. <laughs> um, if you're in the States, I think it's the veteran behaviourists over there that you need to ideally speak to in these situations because you've got to understand the root cause, um, which is what we're going through um, today. So with our fearful dogs, you've got the ones that are kind of back, back away and they'll be a little bit on the shy side. You've also got your dogs that will be more offensive um, with their aggression, with their snappiness. It's more of a, I'll get you before you get me sort of scenario. So again, we're still talking about dogs that are scared. It's just they've learned that the best way to avoid this situation or to get out of this situation is to use aggression. Now this can be related to breed. Um, and it's all through like their fight and flight and what they use. So their fight and flight, for those of you that don't understand fight and flight, feel free to, again, Google. Um, but there are four things you can do with your fight and flight. It affects all species whether you are a lizard, a parrot, a human or a dog, um, when you see a threat, this is what you can do. You can avoid it, you can flight, you can run away from it. That's the one the majority of species will choose if they're able to. You can fool around. That's the one that a lot of people miss. And those of you that run training classes or go to training classes might see this quite a lot. If dogs get overwhelmed and a little bit unsure and a bit anxious, they'll fool around. And that's basically they mess around. So they might bark, they might jump up, they might start being absolutely stupid. I'm being told to breathe. I really struggle with breathing. I'm going to have a brew instead. <laughs> I don't usually do this stuff on my own. <laughs> I like people to feed us. Um, yeah, so they're going to bounce around in classes. I see this a lot in um, some of the toy breeds, um, a lot of the gun dog breeds again, because they don't really have a very strong fight and flight reflex, so they just mess around. Um, and these are the dogs that are usually called like stubborn or they're being silly or they're not listening. And it's not that they're not listening, it's just they can't, they can't focus, they're overwhelmed, there's something in the environment that's scaring them. Um, if you imagine yourself and you're in a situation, say, on public transport and people sit next to you, humans quite often will go for their fool around response. And by fool around, what we tend to do is we get on our phones or we read a book or we'll do something that will distract us from a situation. Um, Myself, I have just demonstrated a classic fool around behaviour because I distracted myself from my brew. These are displacement behaviours for those of you that understand displacement. So it's like your hamsters that suddenly start to groom and lick themselves. Um, sometimes it's like birds that will start preening themselves and things like that. See? Displacement behaviours. Um, when you're feeling a little bit nervous. And so these are ones that you need to look out for because they're like the, the element of your fight and flight response. If they're doing these behaviours, the animal is overwhelmed. You need to get them out of that situation as soon as possible. Don't expect them to learn. If you push it, they've got two other options to go through. If they can't get away from the situation, they can flight. No? Freeze. That's what we're up to. Freeze is the one where they will just stay still. How long they freeze for will depend on the learning experience, the species you're dealing with and the breed. Um, so beagles, unfortunately, have quite a strong freeze response um, genetically, which is why they use a lot in animal testing, because they will just kind of freeze up and, and hold that for quite a long time. 
and I have a lovely video somewhere of a beagle being hounded by a staffy um, mix who's going, come and play, come and play. And he's like, no, no, I don't want to. And he's just stood in this frozen and he's growling. He's doing all the posturing, but he's stood still. And the freeze is something that as owners, you need to be really aware of because the freeze is what lets you know. It's almost like a last recall because most animals will freeze before they bite. So if you've got a puppy or a younger dog where every time something else comes towards them, they just stay still. That's not an animal being calm. That's the main freeze. They're in fight and flight mode. And if pushed, they will snap. They'll either lunge and bite or they'll bolt. So be very aware of when you've got an animal that's in that freeze position. Um, you see it in a lot with some of the animals, um, particularly what I see in lizards because I work a lot with, with reptiles. Um, and they will kind of, they'll freeze up particularly the ones that are armoured, and they'll sit there and they'll wait. And you're like, oh, look, it's really calm. And then they'll suddenly try and bite you um, because you've pushed them. And a lot of that's based on what's called cost-benefit analysis, where the animal kind of weighs up in their head. What's the cost over the benefit of attacking versus running away versus freezing? Um, I'm going to go into cost-benefit analysis and things in another video um, when I discuss lizard behaviour later on. But that's really, that are the kind of things you want to look out for. Because the last thing that you want to do is put an animal in the situation where the option that they choose is the fight one. Um, and the fight one will come through from previous learning if they've learned that that is the only way to get either the people or the dogs to back away. It's just, I'm having you. And the feeling good and the neurochemicals that go on in the brain when they're in that fight flight situation and the relief that they get when the scary thing goes away really strongly reinforces that behaviour. It really... <laughs> Sorry, one of the admins has just sent me like a dancing image stop distracting me lisa it's not good um the relief that comes through when they're in that situation will fuel that behavior and anything that is fueled by fear is usually to learn it's a stronger form of learning because it's a life or death situation in the animal's mind when they're in this situation anyway um, they're dealing with life and death so fight is the best way to get the way out of there again have a look at the breeds that you're dealing with um the biggest breeds that come to mind when we're dealing with fight and flight that will choose the fight option are terriers. And terriers are wonderful little dogs. And they're known for being feisty and vocal and reactive. And we've bred them that way. I mean, if you think of things like Dachshunds or Jack Russells, if you talk about animals that have, and even like Patterdales, that are bred to basically go underground and flush out game or take on badgers if you're a Dachshund. Um... And if you think about the situation they're in, they're in a small hole, a very small hole underground. So their flight option is pretty much taken away from them. You can't really run very fast backwards in a hole away from something if you've got a badger facing you. If you freeze, you're dead. If you fool around, you're dead. So the only option you've got is to fight. And anyone that's got a terrier will realise that they're quite sensitive on their whiskers. And people, for some reason, there's videos all over YouTube where you blow into the dog's face and they'll bite your face. Because if, again, if you're underground and you feel something on your face, it is something that's going to attack you. So the Jack Russell might be down there to flush out the rabbits, but if a badger shows up, he's going to have to be able to deal with that. The ones that were able to deal with that situation are the ones that, one, stay alive and don't get killed by the badger, yay, and two, get bred. Um by whoever it is that owns them to continue working to keep on that line so over hundreds of years we've created these fantastic little reactive killing machines and put them in these teeny little bodies and they are highly reactive and they kind of kill first and ask questions later they will just react and then think back anyone that owns them if you've seen them go into this kind of mode they basically do it and then like huh what happened because they are so reactive and if you think of the fight and flight situation is there's like a series of bubbles that animals will go to um so the further away something is the less inclined they are to deal with it as they go through like their approach avoidance conflict so it's far away they're okay they're not they don't need to react to it the closer it gets they start to do their fight and flight situations and as it starts to activate they're kind of consciously aware and they'll be like, oh, no, there's something over there. I'm not too sure what I'm going to do about this. And they consciously start to think, am I going to flight from this situation? Am I going to mess around? Am I going to get myself ready to fight? There is a line that anyone that owns a reactive dog will pretty much see the line if you look out for it between when your dog is actually able to focus on you. Sorry, I have a 
parents in the background because they're looking after my son decides it's really good to talk while I'm live. Thank you, Dad, again. The internet love you. Um, <laughs> so the closer they get, you basically see a line where they will go from being able to think consciously to unconsciously. And it's basically a switch that happens in, that occurs in the brain is they go from being able to control the reactions to they can't anymore. It shuts off from front brain, goes into hind brain mode, and they will just react. So this is the point where food isn't going to work in the majority of animals. It's almost like being in a bank rub with a gun to your head and someone offering you a cheeseburger. It's not going to happen. You're not going to kind of go, ooh, unless you are really into food and that's your coping strategy. In which case you'll be like, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to shove it all in my mouth. Actually, cake might work for me. I'm not sure. Um, so when you've got animals in that situation, you just have to get them out as fast as you can. Um, and Terriers are renowned for going in and out of the fight or flight thing really, really quickly. So be aware of the animals that you're dealing with when you've got these dogs that bite. Um, the one thing that they don't do is, I'm going to say the word, um, is dominance. It has nothing to do with aggression. Um, if a dog's biting, it's not dominant. If it's biting you, it's not dominant than you. Um, one, as far as the D world goes, um, is, ethologically speaking anyway, it's a relationship between known individuals of the same species. Um, it's all to do with difference. Um, the lower ranking animals will defer to the, to the higher ranking individual. And it's very fluid. It is not strict um, at all. Usually the higher ranking ones are the parents, if you think about things like wolves. There's loads of information on this. I'm not going to go too deep into dominance. Um, but I can guarantee if your dog is biting you, it's not dominant. It's generally it's scared or it's resource guarding, again, is a fear-based behaviour. So if you've got an animal that is on the sofa, on the bed, and it's snapping at you, chances are it's either learned that as you approach, you're going to grab it and pull it off. It's really, really comfortable. It might be in pain, which is another reason why your dogs might bite. Um, and it's snapping at you to make you leave it alone. It's not in its head thinking, I'm on the bed, I'm on the sofa, I'm more dominant than you, I'm going to bite you and put you in your place. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. There is so much research on this. Um, that I will discuss at some point if people are after a dominance talk I'll quite happily um, go into the D word and we can have a nice little chat about dominance in different species and things like that <laughs> look at that, feeling around I hate talking about dominance unless I've got like all my information in front of me um, but yeah, if they're biting you it's not due to dominance um, again, have a look at medical conditions so as a clinical animal behaviourist all of the cases that I see come in veterinary referral um, so I can't see anyone unless a vet has cleared the animal first. And that's to make sure that they're not in pain or that they don't have epilepsy um, or other kind of metabolic or neurological conditions that might cause them to snap out. Another one that springs to mind is one that's all over everywhere. If you've got Cocker Spaniels, which is Cocker Rage. Cocker Rage is really, really, really rare. Um, every case I've been out to see that has involved Cocker Rage hasn't actually been Cocker Rage. Um, true cocker rage, from my knowledge of it, is the aggression is very spontaneous, it is very snappy, and it's like a very sudden. Every time I go out to see an animal that apparently has cocker rage, it's not cocker rage, it's, it's resource guarding. Um, if you're living out with cocker spaniels and a lot of your retrieving breeds, is that they're bred to retrieve and fetch things, which means they have a very high um, desire to keep hold of objects that they found. And if you think about it on a shoot, if you've sent your spaniel or your labrador to go and get your pheasant and on the way back they decide to drop it it's not a very good gun dog so they, they have to keep hold of it they don't give it up to anyone else other than the handler so again this is a trait that we have bred into these animals similar to the terriers with terriers we've, we've bred in that reactivity um, that kill first ask questions later sort of side of them and our gun dogs and the retrieving ones particularly we've bred in that desire to keep and hold things um, some of those, so your Labradors are the best ones that come to mind. You don't always see a lot of resource guarding in Labradors. I don't see a huge amount of Labradors with aggression. Um, and that's mostly because it's starting to change now. Um, but mostly because if you've, in the gun dog world, and particularly originally with, um, if the Labradors were showing any kinds of aggression, they were usually kind of shot. <laughs> they were either killed or they weren't bred from, basically. Um, which is very harsh and not very nice. But the aggression gene isn't as strong in Labradors um, as it is in some of the other breeds. Um, in your cockers, they're quite small. 
you get a lot of resource guarding in those kinds of breeds, which isn't a bad thing if it's dealt with properly. With resource guiding, again, we discussed a little bit with Jane in last session, is people try to trick and bribe the dog into giving things up and the dogs don't trust you anymore. And trading and things is a really good way to teach your dogs to let go. But they also need to know that you're not going to keep stealing things off them and they're going to go, oh, okay, I'll come to you and I'll give you this and you're taking it all the time. They need to be aware of other things. And resource guarding, again, is something that we will discuss on a later chat. This is just going over all the reasons why your dogs may bite. Um, so medical conditions, pain. Um, please, if you have a dog that is biting, get it checked out by the vet. Make sure there are no genuine reasons why it may bite. Any animals, um, horses in particular as well, suffer a great amount of pain. Cats, great amount of pain. They're not very good at showing it. Because if they show it, they're showing weakness, which makes them more vulnerable. Um, so ensure that they're, they're checked up thoroughly. They don't have ear issues or dental issues or eye problems or head problems, spinal issues. Because um, all of those will make them more reactive to touch. If they've got skin conditions, um, I'm thinking Sharpays, Bichons, Westies, dogs that are known for having lots of allergies, they're not going to want to be touched. And you do have some dogs that just, they don't want to be cuddled and fussed all the time. Any of you that have subscribed to my YouTube channel, there's a video on there about hugging dogs. Um, and my husky, Deefer, who is around somewhere, um, tolerates hugs. He doesn't particularly like them. He doesn't hate them, um, but he doesn't like them. He's not a cuddly dog. He loves to sit next to you or in front of you and, and have like circular scratches like all on his chest or the back of his head. He loves that kind of interaction, adores it. You put your arms around him and he's like, I don't really want this. I don't like it. Um, they're entitled to that. There are some dogs that will want to come and sit on you and they'll sit on your lap, but they don't actually want to be touched. They just want to be close to you and enjoy that companionship. They don't want to be messed around. And if they sit on you and they're being messed around with and they're doing all these subtle lip licking and looking away and those sorts of behaviours and you keep ignoring them, then they're going to become snappy. They're going to become irritable. And as humans, we have such a desire to touch. Um, at a conference in Denmark, Elaine Hanley touched on this and one of her um, things because humans are primates we have an innate desire to touch we are comforted by touch so we comfort others through touch so if your dog's in distress or if you need a cuddle we we'll tend to hug our dogs and it's nice to hug your dog it's really nice some dogs really enjoy it in the video my labrador she will get on me and she's like proper hug she really likes a hug um, but most dogs don't because that's not in their ethology that's not part of their their behavioral repertoire you don't see dogs going around hugging each other um, you know they rub each other they'll nuzzle rub they'll groom each other they're the ways that they interact so the petting the stroking those kinds of things that's how you dogs like to be handled and like to be touched there are exceptions to every rule so we are almost at the end of our chats um and this is just a little brief into the reasons why your dogs may be biting and snapping and um, if anyone has any questions put them in the comments below and i'll quite happily answer them but if you're talking online, asking people questions about dogs that are biting, please try and get in touch with a professional because as I've just gone through, I spent half an hour telling you all the different reasons why your dog might be biting. And if you're speaking to people that haven't considered all of those or just assuming that it's something else, you're going to get an incorrect diagnosis. You're going to end up doing the wrong thing and the welfare of the animal could be compromised and you may get bitten in the process. So please, first put a call if you've got a dog that is biting or looks like it might bite, go to your vet. Get the medical elements ruled out. Get the pain elements ruled out. Seek a specialist. So a professional clinical animal behaviourist or a veterinary behaviourist. Someone that understands all these differentials and knows how to create a consultation, take a history and work out which of these situations they're dealing with and they can then formulate a plan. When you're dealing with dogs that are snapping, you don't want to focus too much on the operant side of things, which is the training. Um, because it, a lot of it is it's emotional based, it's, it's subconscious sort of behaviour, so you need to do a lot more kind of classical work underneath and confidence building a lot of the time before you can go to the operant training. Um, sometimes you can get lucky and the food that you're doing, if you're using positive reinforcement in your, oper in your operant training, um, the counter conditioning effects will, will kick in and you can get some good results. But it's a lot better if you get that site sorted first, you desensitise, you build up the animal's confidence, again, depending on what you're dealing with. If you're desensitizing, you desensitize to most of the emotions. You can get, teach them to be calm if they've got frustration issues, to be calm if they're fearful. But again, you need to make sure that you're checking out everything if you've got these dogs that are biting, because it's a serious thing. Here in the UK, you know, we've got laws against it. In most countries, there are laws against dangerous dogs and dogs that bite. 
Um, you don't want to have a criminal record. You don't want to put a death sentence on your dog over something that could have been avoided. If your dog is biting, please don't be aggressive back. Um, otherwise, as far as dogs are concerned, you are now being unpredictably aggressive towards them for no reason. Increases anxiety. In they can't predict anything anymore and they'll just keep on reacting in this really big conflict cycle. So you want to check out for pain and medical conditions. Have a look at the situation you're dealing with. Is it a younger dog? Is it a dog that is just attention seeking and they're doing like the jumping up mouthing thing? This tends to be more in younger dogs unless it's a learned behavior. You know, are they getting frustrated about something? Are they redirecting their behavior onto something else? Are they fearful? If they're fearful, are they trying to avoid and flight first? Or are they just going straight into the, the fight and reacting? There are some dogs, unfortunately, that get such a kick out of the um, reactions um, that you do that they'll start actively seeking fights just to make themselves feel better. Now, apparently I have some questions that I can't see. So I'll just refresh my screen. Oh, hey, people are talking to me. Yay. Um, when you are pity that nips and bites her hands and wants attention of playing, she just bruises. Oh, okay, that sounds like the excitement, frustration sort of one. Um, again, I can't tell you too much because I haven't seen it, so I can't diagnose. Um, but if you're sure that it's more the intention seeking thing, this is when we want to teach them something else to do. So it's building in the alternative behavior that I discussed earlier with the German Shepherd. Um, where what would you rather than do in that situation? So reward that. And it's a really high rate of reinforcement to begin with. So would you rather them sit? Do you want them to lie down? Do you want them to not let go of the lead? Um, with the lead one, it could be a frustration thing. It could be an anxiety thing um, because they're outside in the world. So it could be one of those displacement behaviors that I mentioned earlier in the fool around thing. If you're sure about the attention seeking when she's playing, um, then that's giving her other things. So teaching her to sit first. So try to prevent the behavior from occurring, trying to reward it, ask for an alternative behavior and really reward that. Um, so every time she sits, she gets your attention. Every time she sits, she gets your attention. Give her a no reward cue. Um, they're really useful for attention seeking behaviors. Um, actually, I should probably do a, a chat on attention seeking behaviors and how to deal with them, coming to think of it. Um, but if the alternative behavior one, there's a post somewhere on positive pet advice um, where people give in to that. Um, but if you're having those kinds of issues in a one-year-old, try and get a professional in if you can that can come out and look at the behaviour. Because um, these aren't things that we can treat and diagnose just from a comment. Because as I've just mentioned, I've spent half an hour explaining all the reasons why they could be doing this. Um, but as a first aid measure, try and avoid the situations where you know they're going to bite and teach her something else that she can do in those situations and work on that. So rather trying to stop the unwanted behaviour, teach on her own behaviour and focus on teaching that. So every time they get it right, they get a reward for it. Has anyone got any other questions before I skedaddle off? Skedaddle, oh, I like that word. I haven't used that for ages. Is that a British word? Not too sure. Um. Okay, no more questions so far. I'm gonna end my live session then. Thank you all for watching. I hope you found it useful. Um, hopefully Neil can be back next week and we can get it up running on the um, YouTube channel. Um, if you YouTube and search for me, Danielle Beck, um, then you'll be able to find it. Oh, I've got another question come up on a message. Why do owners let their curious dogs pull on the lead towards an obviously aggressive barking pulling dog? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, it's one thing that baffles me. Having owned a reactive dog, the one thing I used to hate and used to cringe is when you're walking along and you see a dog running towards you. And you hear those dreaded words. Don't worry, he's friendly. Ah, that, he's, my dog is and my dog's scared and he's going to bite your dog. Um, I don't know why people let the curious dogs pull. Um, I see a lot of them where they've got dogs that are frustrated. Where they know the easiest way to deal with that is to let the dog go and sniff the other dog. And then they'll be fine. Which is great for your dog, not necessarily for the other dog. They, those dogs, they need to learn some frustration tolerance and some self-control. Um, Jane and I are going to do a bit of a chat on that in a couple of weeks time um, so yeah I just wish people would just stop doing that it'd be a lot easier um, but thank you for joining me and I hope you learned something again feel free to subscribe to the YouTube that's where the rest of the chats are in our files section on our positive pet advice it lists all the previous ones feel free to go back 
and have a read through. So far, we've covered things about cats. We've covered um, puppy development. We've, pup we've copied. We've done puppy breeding and um, what to do when you first get a puppy. Um, all kinds of things are on there. Um, and then you, you can at least let us know when when we're live and you can let us know if you're enjoying the chats. I will let you all go. Um, if there's anything you want to talk about, send me a message in positive pet advice and I'll quite happily have a chat to you. But it's been lovely seeing you all. I miss my co-pilot, um, Neil, greatly because I'm rubbish on my own. But, you know, these things happen. And I'll see you all next week. Bye.